legal apology framework to not only explain why BP's approach, which represents the best practice in crisis response, failed to resonate with people and then talked about the practical considerations for understanding when apology is going to be more and less effective. We then took the problem of corporate social responsibility and looked at the role of trying to build stronger understandings about when and why it doesn't doesn't work in order to improve an organization's reputation. And the result was a theory that then we can be applying in other situations to see if that theory provides future guidance. At its heart, when we talk about theory, we're always talking about practical guidance on what happens or could happen. But I know that students and some practitioners alike balk at the utility of theory. Trust me, I've heard the same arguments for the last 20 years about ivory towers and all that rubbish. My real objective in this podcast is to talk about the functional role that theory plays and to make the case that good practitioners use and should use theory to guide their core strategy. Whenever I can, I like to attend the International Risk and Crisis Communication Conference in Florida. I know there are worse places to be in early March than Central Florida. But the thing that I really appreciate about this conference is that it's a great combination of academics and practitioners that attend. And this is something we're working on encouraging in Europe as well, because the interchange between the groups only improves the community's working and theoretical knowledge about risk and crisis communication. So in 2016, I was sitting in a keynote panel discussion where very distinguished academics were talking about their experiences in talking to people affected by crises and capturing these moving stories to better understand where tactics had failed in different crises. Then one of the practitioners asked a very simple question couched in an important critique of the field that went something like this. It's great that you're able to capture these narratives, but where are the predictive theories that would help us really design messages to be more successful in handling crises? The question was followed by a murmur of agreement from practitioners around the room. Now, this wasn't the first time that I'd heard a practitioner expressing appreciation for theory and research in risk and crisis communication. In fact, across the domains of communication practice, I would argue that risk and crisis practitioners are some of the most research friendly and theoretically driven practitioners. It was though the first time that I'd heard such a public frustration with the state of theory building in risk and crisis communication. My initial reaction was absolutely to agree with the practitioner's assessment about the state of theory in the field, but this question also prompted me to take a deep dive into the state of risk and crisis research to answer this guy's question for myself. And what I found is that while there is still a lot of work being done in terms of theory building in risk and crisis communication, and this is true of any field, especially one like ours that's still in the process of institutionalizing itself, but the thing is that there is a rich body of theory that we can tap into if we know where to look and how to approach the decisions that need to be made in a theory-driven practice. The fact of the matter is that when we talk about theory, a lot of people tune out because they believe that theory is only for the nerds wearing jacket and with leather elbow pads sitting in academic ivory towers. So let me try and persuade you that to be a good practitioner, you should have a deep understanding of theory. Now, there are a lot of leather elbow pad wearing reasons to appreciate and use theory in research, but let's be practical about it. In the real world where organizations spend money on any communication campaign, any social responsibility program, and any stakeholder related research, we have to show a return on the investment, ROI, that the organization has made. And if the expenditures don't show a direct ROI, so for example, increased profit, donations, votes, or the impact on the organization's key performance indicators, KPIs, then there's little evidence that the money has been wisely spent. In a crisis context, we already know the stakes are high for organizations in terms of material, reputational, and relational risks posed by the crises. Thus, my basic argument is that it's fundamentally irresponsible not to do everything we can to optimize success in achieving ROI, KPI, 
relational and situational objectives. But how does theory improve ROI and KPI? Think of theory like a playbook used in sports. When any sports manager puts together his or her playbook, what they're doing is taking all of their experience, factoring in their team's strengths and weaknesses, factoring in their opposition strengths and weaknesses, and then developing a strategy that they think will help them win. What grounds the playbook is a lot of data, and sports teams spend a lot of money to hire the best coach or manager they can afford, one whose experience in decision making has been proven sound, and one who has a vision for that team that complements the team's goals. They also evaluate their own players every day, every week, and throughout the season. They scout new players, they scout other teams for their game strategies and their, their players, and then they develop strategy from all of this. The movie Moneyball with Brad Pitt was the story of how the Oakland A's team and then manager Billy Bean fundamentally changed the way that the game of baseball was managed in the U.S. The old style of management was not data-driven nor theoretically grounded, but what Bean demonstrated was that identifying a theory and a data-driven strategy towards player acquisition and management improved performance. Not a sports fan? Not a problem. This is the same thing that happens in the entertainment industry when putting together a new television series or movie beginning with the director. It's the same process that's used in product development and so on and so forth. Why? Because we're talking about massive amounts of money and a whole lot of expectations. Let's start with the definition of what a theory is. It's both a prediction about what will happen in the future as well as a summary of what has already happened in the past. So all good theory is based on tangible evidence. If we think about the playbook analogy, then why would a coach recommend a particular formation or play? It's because in most cases, it has worked in the past and the coach would expect it to work in the future. But that does not mean that the playbooks always stay the same. As time goes on, the playbook is updated when better information is available or different plays prove more successful. We use theories in our everyday lives, it's just that we seldom label them as a theory. So let's say that you go to your regular bus stop every day for a week, and every single day the bus is five to ten minutes later than its posted timetable. So what are some reasonable explanations for this? Well, one, the bus company may not be able to maintain the timetable. There could be roadworks that temporarily delay the bus. The timetable may have simply changed but the posted schedule hadn't been updated, or the traffic at that time of day may be consistently slow, so the optimal timetable just can't be maintained. Any of these could be a reasonable explanation, but what do you do in response to the pattern that you've noticed with the perpetually late bus? Well, you could surmise that you just didn't need to leave the house for an additional five to 10 minutes, get some extra sleep, have some breakfast, something else. This would be a reasonable action to take and represent a rudimentary theory that you've formed that the bus is not going to be on time. So over the next week, you could test to see if your theory is true. And over the next week, you could, if that was true every single day, you could conclude that your prediction was true and plan accordingly. Thing is though, an incomplete prediction may mean that you end up missing your bus as well. A better approach would be to determine whether you hit that snooze button one more time would be to figure out which explanation or a combination of them was most likely to be true. If there are roadworks, then knowing when they were going to end would tell you when you needed to go out early again. If the start of the school day meant that traffic was heavier in your area, then knowing when school was or wasn't in session could let you better predict when the bus was going to be on time or late, and so on. And really, this is all research-based theory is. We collect data about real events, attitudes, judgments, and situations, and then analyze it to identify consistent and verifiable patterns that allow us to make predictions. Over time, we test our theories in different contexts to see if those predictions work out differently or the same in different contexts or with different groups. Developing good theory takes time, as in years. But this is why theory-based decision-making and strategy generally improves performance. 
It builds on our mistakes, our successes, and our knowledge from the past in order to make reasonable predictions about the future. It's also able to account for the strange and bizarre circumstances that lead to excellent or terrible outcomes as being different from the norm because it pools together many different experiences to define what is typical and atypical. Because theory, especially in risk and crisis communication, is built from what happens in the real world. It gives us a playbook. And that helps us make better predictions about how our organization should manage risk or respond to crises. It lets us have better ROI and impact our KPIs much more positively. How do we translate the sports analogy or playbook into theory informed crisis response? Well, it's about good decision making. Later in this series, we'll talk about strategically planning crisis response messages. But if we think about theory as a good decision making tool, then you can see how we've talked about theory in a very practical way throughout this series in discussing stakeholder relationship management model as a diagnostic tool for understanding the complex relationships that affect organizations facing or in crisis. This helps organizations to evaluate what they need to do in order to effectively manage their stakeholder relationships during a crisis. Why do sports teams hire the best managers and players they can? To give them the best advantage they can have before the game or match even starts. Earlier in this series, we discussed crisis capacity building. Theory provides support to this. If an organization goes through the process to evaluate its culture, its staff and its leadership in order to evaluate its crisis readiness to respond to a crisis or to recover from a crisis, then it's likely that it will have to address organizational and management or leadership issues. They may even have to make adaptations to their approach to brand management or cultural competence. If this is where the biggest areas of need are in the organization, then it should consider those types of theories that would target capacity building by using theories like decision making, organizational change, learning, leadership, cultural competence, cultural trauma, or social marketing to help guide the strategy that they developed in order to meet the specific objectives identified in a needs assessment. More than that, crisis capacity building is also about issues management, so they may need to initiate a strategy to mitigate risk for the organization or its stakeholders. Doing this ahead of time, as we've discussed, better enables the organization to help to respond to and manage a crisis if it should occur. Depending on the type of organization, stakeholders, or types of risk, this could range from applying theories like anticipatory impression management to build an organization's reputation in anticipation of negative events, or helping prepare stakeholders themselves for crises by applying the IDEA model. In either direction, these types of strategic objectives can also help build capacity and applying these theories give organizations a playbook to plan and anticipate the types of ROI they can expect for these activities. Finally, as part of the crisis capacity building notion, organizations should get to know their stakeholders better, both internally and externally. Internally, using playbooks provided by theories like leader member exchange, organizational learning, organization perception management theory, or behavioral resistance theory, or even conflict management theory, can provide organizations with meaningful intelligence on their internal stakeholders, and therefore how effectively the organization can respond to changing circumstances. Externally, applying the psychology and learning theories like attribution theory, emotional dimensionality theory, or social approval theory, or certainly persuasion theories like self-presentation theory or the extended parallel process model, can help organizations piece together their stakeholder attitudes as we've discussed in chapter 10. Earlier in the series, we identified eight tactic categories and more than 40 individual tactics that organizations could choose to respond to crises. But how should an organization pick the best tactics to use? Fortunately, for those of us in the broad field of corporate communication, this should be our wheelhouse of strength, but it can still be difficult. If we understand our organization's capacity and we've done our work with the stakeholder relationship management model that I've laid out throughout this series, then it's simply a matter of identifying which stakeholder, 
issue and organizational related concepts are going to matter in a situation and then identifying the plays, i.e. the theories, that are going to help us to choose the best tactics. And this is what the sports teams are doing when they evaluate their own players and scout other teams. They're laying the groundwork to build their own team strategy before, throughout, and after the season ends. For example, if our organization has a good reputation, but is committed to transgression, then a theory like the apologetic ethics framework is a natural fit because it's most effective when the organization has done something wrong, but has a great reputation. If, however, we're responding to a disaster where we need our stakeholders to be able to manage their fear effectively, meaning that we need to focus on building efficacy and telling them what to do in order to keep themselves safe, then a theory like the extended parallel process model could be the most effective. However, unless we've done our work ahead of time with our crisis capacity building, it's more difficult to quickly identify the best play to help manage both the organizational and the stakeholder interests. In a crisis context, being quick and decisive is vital to being viewed as a credible source of information and helping set the agenda for the crisis response. In the next chapter, we will discuss how strategically planning crisis response messages works, and I will provide an example of a crisis plan to help direct the decisions that organizations can follow ahead of time in order to plan their initial response. Thank you.